So we are broadcasting now. We'll be starting in a few minutes. I want to welcome everybody here for the last day of our E3 Summit. If you're just coming in, you can uh, put in the chat box where you're from. Just another minute or two. And this session will be recorded um, and available on the app it, um, for those people that uh, have can't uh, attend live. And it is 12 o'clock, so I think we will uh, start the presentation. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Josephine Greenman. I'm the Chief Science Officer for the Marfan Foundation. I also like to introduce my colleague, Bruno De Salva, who will be helping me in the background. Um, we want to welcome everybody to the... My slides are always not working. <laughs> Hold on one second. There we go. We want to welcome everybody to the final, to the third and final week of the E3 Summit, educating, empowering, and enriching our community. It's being brought to you by the Marfan Foundation and our divisions, the Lois Deep Syndrome Foundation and the VEDS Movement. And we also like to welcome all the Stickler involved people as well. Um, we also have partners this time uh, with uh, in Europe um, from Vassern, who have also been presenters throughout this conference. We want to thank everybody for making this um, truly historic. Uh, we've had it, we've had over 20, uh, close to 2,800 reg registrants from 72 different countries. And we hope that everybody's had the opportunity to connect with people from all over the world in the app and that maybe you can maintain these connections after the summit. As you know, you are not alone in this journey. We really want to thank our presenting sponsors, um, Brigham and Women's Hospital and the American Communications and Construction Company. So before we start the presentation, I just want to let you know that the International E3 Summit is a forum to provide an open discussion of issues related to genetic aortic and vascular conditions. Opinions stated in each of the talks are those of the speakers and not necessar necessarily those of the Marfan Foundation or Vassern. If questions arise or clarifications are needed, please contact us at marfan.org backslash E3ask. 
We are getting a, a lot of questions into that uh, email. So uh, please be patient while we get to your questions. So uh, one other thing is that after each uh, session, we would really appreciate your uh, feedback on the session. And you can do that right in the app by clicking on the rate button. And it's a simple three, uh, three question survey. So today I'd like to introduce our presenter. Um, we are very uh, glad to have Dr. Michael Cohen from Massachusetts General Hospital here with us. Um, Dr. Cohen, would you like to uh, say a few words? Sure, yeah, I um, feel very happy to be here and I appreciate the opportunity, Joe. Thank you so much for the invitation to talk and uh, certainly is an amazing platform that you've put together here. So we're making the best out of this difficult situation in, in the COVID times, um, but uh, the attendance really seems like uh, it's been quite amazing. So I, I have pre-recorded my talk and I'll, I'll let everyone listen, but I will be certainly available to answer any questions that anyone has at the conclusion of the talk. Yes, and so we'll be getting to the presentation and there is the Q&A box. So we do have several questions that are in there already. Um, but if you have any questions during the presentation, you can just keep putting them in there and we'll get to those. All right, thank you very much. And we'll go to the presentation. You can turn off your videos. My name is Michael Cohen, and it is my honor and privilege to be presenting to you today on the topic of Stickler syndrome and hearing loss. Uh, as a financial disclosure, I do have a sponsored research agreement with Medell Corporation. But the reason we're gathered here today is to talk about Stickler syndrome and how hearing loss, loss relates to it. And the reason for that is that 62% of people with Stickler syndrome have hearing loss. And this is the distribution. We see that the majority of people with Stickler syndrome who have hearing loss have a sensory neural hearing loss that 14% have conductive hearing loss, and 18% have mixed hearing loss. And I thought we should talk a little bit about what those words mean and how they relate to the treatment of hearing loss and Stickler syndrome. So to start, we should talk about the anatomy of the ear, how the ear works, and how hearing loss can then relate. So this is a diagram of the external ear, which is here, the ear canal, the eardrum, and the space behind the eardrum is called the middle ear. And the middle ear has three small bones which connect the eardrum. This is the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, and these connect the eardrum to the inner ear. And the inner ear is comprised of the cochlea, which is the spiral-shaped organ, uh, and the vestibule, which is this portion of the balance organ here, and then the semicircular canals, which are also related to balance. And when sound comes into the eardrum, it hits the eardrum, which vibrates. The bones of hearing then carry those vibrations to the inner ear and cause the fluid inside the cochlea to vibrate, which then stimulates the cochlear nerve and that sends a signal to your brain and that's how we hear. So when we talk about conductive and sensory neural hearing loss, the difference is where the problem is happening. Conductive hearing loss is a hearing loss that occurs because something in this conductive pathway isn't working, meaning the sound vibrations are not getting to the inner ear. So that could be a big ball of wax in the ear canal. It could be fluid behind the eardrum, or it could be a problem with these little bones, the ossicles. Any of those things will result in a conductive hearing loss. Now, if the problem is with the cochlea itself, or the nerve that connects to the cochlea, then we have what we call a sensory neural hearing loss. Sensory refers to the cochlea, neural refers to the nerve. So that's the difference between conductive and sensory neural hearing loss. Now, to better understand how this manifests, we really need to understand how to read an audiogram or a hearing test. So this is sort of the blank display that we have uh, when, we, when we are going to record an audiogram. And we'll start by looking at how we mark the right ear. So the right ear is um, represented by circles. And red, right, round is a good mnemonic to, to remember that. Uh, if the audiogram is written in color, then the right ear is red and the left ear is blue. But sometimes they're black and white, so we don't have that distinction. But what we see is these numbers represent the frequency that's being tested. 
and the numbers on the vertical axis represent how loud the sound has to be for the patient to hear. So for example, right here, this circle represents a tone or a beep that's being presented at 500 hertz, and the response is at 10 decibels. So at 500 hertz, the person was able to hear that at 10 decibels. So what does that mean more specifically? This is the left ear, which is in, in blue. Uh, blue X's represent the left ear. And this would be an example of a hearing test for someone with normal hearing. And specifically normal hearing occurs at the level of 20 decibels or better. And this is, if, if the marks are within this range, then we would say that that person is normal hearing. Now, as we go lower, the hearing loss gets worse. So mild hearing loss would be in the 20 to 40 decibel range. Moderate hearing loss would be 40 to 60 decibels. Moderately severe is 60 to 75 decibels. Severe would be 75 to 90 decibels. And profound hearing loss is hearing loss that is poorer than 90 decibels. So this would be an example of an audiogram of a person with hearing loss. And we can see at the lower frequencies, so 125 hertz, 250 hertz, that's like the subwoofer, uh, though the person is able to hear that pretty well. Uh, we're in the normal range here, but it quickly slopes down into this moderately severe hearing loss range. So if we put the, that little map back up, we can see it starts in normal and goes right down through mild, moderate, and into moderately severe. And when you think about what frequencies are important for speech, the whole range is important, but the center is kind of the most important area for understanding what people are saying. So hearing loss that's in sort of the middle of this frequency spectrum is really, uh, really manifests as difficulty with understanding what people are saying. Now, this is an example of sensory neural hearing loss, and I know that because there's another set of marks which we haven't talked about yet. We talked about the circles and the X's, and the circles here are talking about air conduction. How do we test air conduction? We do that by putting a little probe into the person's ear and we play the sound. And if you hear it at that level, it means the sound is going through your ear, your eardrum, the bones of hearing, all the way to your inner ear. But there is a way to skip that whole middle ear system, to skip the whole conductive pathway, and that's called bone conduction. And for anyone who's had a hearing test, you know that sometimes at the end of the hearing test, they'll put a device that oscillates or vibrates onto your forehead, or in the area behind the ear, and that is doing bone conduction testing. That's sending vibrations directly to the cochlea and bypassing the whole middle ear system. And these little brackets show us the results of the bone conduction testing. So if the bracket here is also down in the hearing loss range, that tells us that even if you bypass that whole conductive system and send sound vibrations directly to the inner ear, there's still a hearing loss. And that's consistent with sensory neural hearing loss. Conductive hearing loss looks like this. For example, there's a left ear. We see we're in the moderate hearing loss range, maybe a little bit in the mild here, but pretty much in the moderate hearing loss range with the air conduction testing. But when we do the bone conduction testing, that's totally up in the normal range, which means this person has a problem hearing because the sound is not getting to the inner ear. If it gets to the inner ear, as it does when we do the bone conduction testing, the patient hears it just fine. Uh, but if, if we're going through the ear canal, they're not hearing it at all. And that's because of one of those conductive problems we discussed, either fluid or a problem with the bones of hearing or sometimes a hole in the eardrum, those sorts of things. Okay, so it's time for a little quiz. Here's an audiogram. I want everyone to take a look and think in your mind for a moment uh, what degree of hearing loss this is. Okay, so this is normal. Right, these are air conduction thresholds in the left and right ear, and all the responses are at 20 decibels or better. And so this would be a normal hearing test. Okay, how about this one? So we have in the left ear, which is blue, all the responses are better than 20 decibels, so that's normal. And in the right ear, we are at 40 to 60 decibels for these responses and this is a moderate hearing loss in the right ear. In fact, it dips even a little bit into the moderately severe range of the high frequencies. Now, I want everyone to think in your mind, is this a conductive or a sensory neural hearing loss? Remember what these little brackets mean. This is the bone conduction. So the bone conduction is still pretty good, right? That's at 20, 20, 15, 15, 15. So this would be normal bone conduction, abnormal air conduction, and that is a conductive 
hearing loss. So this is right ear with conductive hearing loss, left ear with normal hearing. Okay, here's another one. So here we see on the left ear, we're in the moderate, mild to moderate hearing loss range. And the brackets are on the same place as the air conduction here, but there's a little gap in a couple of places. Same thing with the red one. We've got mild hearing loss at this right ear, but there's some gaps where the air conduction seems to be okay. So it's weird because that looks kind of like a little conductive and a little sensory neural. And what we call that is a mixed hearing loss. A mixed hearing loss is where you have some conductive hearing loss, but you also have sensory neural hearing loss. And that's a very common phenomenon in Stickler syndrome, especially in younger people with Stickler syndrome in, in children. And this is actually a patient of mine with Stickler syndrome um, who was at about six years of age when this hearing test was done. Here's another hearing test. And this one looks pretty similar, but the brackets are a little bit closer to the air conduction, maybe a little bit of a mix, but this is primarily sensory neural. You know, these brackets are down here in the mild hearing loss range with the air conduction threshold. So I would probably err towards calling this a sensory neural hearing loss. This is the older sibling of the previous audiogram. Uh, and so this has, ear has shifted to a more uh, sensory neural hearing loss uh, zone. So those are just two typical audiograms for young people with Stickler syndrome. And when we break it down, you can see that, you know, we said this earlier, 62% of people with Stickler syndrome have hearing loss, but the type of Stickler syndrome does correlate with the risk and type of hearing loss as well. So, for example, in Stickler syndrome type 1, about half and half either have hearing loss or don't have hearing loss. And those who have hearing loss are primarily sensory neural, but there's a good portion that's mixed or conductive. And as we um, progress Stickler syndrome type 2, uh, a higher proportion of people have hearing loss, so a smaller percentage, only 17.5, don't have any hearing loss. And stickler type 3, an even larger percentage of people do eventually develop hearing loss for pretty much everyone is hearing loss, and say for sticker 5, where everyone has sensory neural hearing loss. So that being said, um, the, these types of stickler syndrome are less prevalent. And so because of that, because most people with stickler syndrome have one, uh, two, or three, um, that we have only 62% of people with Stickler syndrome overall having hearing loss. But this is sort of that breakdown of type of hearing loss as it relates to the type of Stickler syndrome. Now, interestingly, about 20% of people with Stickler syndrome have a cleft palate. Why is that relevant for hearing loss? Well, a cleft palate is a, is a very uh, serious risk factor for having eustachian tube dysfunction. The eustachian tube is a passageway that connects the middle ear to the back of the nose and allows for equal pressure and drainage of mucus from the middle ear space. In people that have cleft palates, even if the cleft palate has been repaired, the eustachian tube often doesn't work very well. And it, and it continues to have dysfunction, sometimes for many years, even into adulthood. So when you have eustachian tube dysfunction, you have a high risk of having middle ear fluid. And if you have middle ear fluid, you almost always will have some degree of conductive hearing loss. So let's talk a little bit more about conductive hearing loss. This again would be an audiogram of conductive hearing loss where you can see the bone conduction is up in the normal range. And there's this significant difference between the bone conduction and the air conduction. This is a moderate conductive hearing loss in both ears. And even in this case, these responses are in the normal range, but there is a gap between air and bone. And sometimes we see this in someone who is very good hearing at baseline, but has a little bit of fluid, where they're hearing still in the normal range, but they could be hearing better than they are. So this is something we have to address as well. So just to get a sense of what the anatomy of the eardrum is and how we would diagnose middle ear fluid, this is a normal eardrum. And you can see this round edge, this rim of the eardrum, this is called the annulus, or the ring around the eardrum. This part where you can see the blood vessels, that's the skin of the ear canal. So it's normal to see these blood vessels here. That's just a normal part of the skin of the ear canal. And then there's this white projection that comes down from the top that has some vessels running along it. This is the malleus bone that we discussed earlier. And the malleus is tightly connected to the eardrum itself. And this eardrum is so translucent that we can see through it and we can actually see the incus here, which is that anvil bone, and we can kind of get a sense of the stapes right here, the stapes bone. 
Now this is an ear that has fluid. So two things are going on. One, the malleus, which we see here, is retracted, meaning it's angled inward. This one looks kind of straight up and down. This one looks angled. We can also see some of these blood vessels around the annulus look brighter red. They look more red than the same blood, blood vessels here and here. These are a little bit more pale. And we can also see bubbles. So this is an air bubble here and here and here, which means there's fluid. This is mucus or fluid behind the eardrum. And that mucus is causing a conductive hearing loss. So what do we do when that mucus gets infected? Well, we see acute otitis media, and that is pus now behind the eardrum, not just mucus. And we can also see that those vessels running on the malleus are very inflamed, they're red, the eardrum looks like it's bulging out. Here we see a nice angle between the annulus and the drum. We see this nice bright dot called the light reflex and the translucency of the drum. Here it's totally opaque and there's white fluid behind it. So that's an acute ear infection. And for people that have chronic eustachian tube dysfunction, they're more prone to ear infections, more prone to fluid. One of the treatments we can do, which is one of the best treatments for chronic eustachian tube dysfunction or recurrent middle ear infections would be ear tube insertion. So this is a video. If you're squeamish, you may want to look away for this portion. Uh, but this is a video of ear tube insertion. So here's the eardrum again. Here's the malleus. And this is the drum. And I've made an incision in the drum with a tiny knife. And I'm using a little suction cannula to suck out all that mucus. And this is what a tube looks like. So this tube is hollow in the middle. And it has a flange on either side. And I'm just gently placing that inner flange through the incision. And now we can see right into the middle ear and that tube will ventilate the middle ear and prevent infection. So here we go again with the other side. We're making a little incision in the eardrum, and there's mucus behind the eardrum, that fluid, and we're going to use a suction again to suction out that mucus. In some cases, you can see here, it's very, very thick. This causes a significant conductive hearing loss because it's like you're underwater. That mucus is just blocking and, and preventing good movement of the eardrum. And you can see this is taking a long time to get out. There's so much mucus in there. And it's so thick that you really have to just spend some time getting it out of there. Now the middle ear is clear. And this patient will hear better in the recovery room. It's almost an immediate improvement in the hearing. And we're placing a tube in this side. And once that tube is in, we have good ventilation and good hearing. So that's how ear tube insertion works. Now, middle ear fluid is the most common cause of conductive hearing loss. But it's not the only cause of conductive hearing loss. And it's really important to consider this, especially in people with Stickler syndrome, because sometimes the hearing loss is, the conductive hearing loss is, re is related to the ossicles, or those bones behind the eardrum. So these are the ossicles. We talked about them earlier, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, or the malleus, incus, and stapes. And these ossicles are tiny. Here is just a, a, a comparison of the human ossicles in, next to a dime. And you can see, this is the size of the malleus. This is where there's a joint between the head of the malleus and the body of the incus. And this joint is just like other joints in your body. It has joint fluid, it has synovium, it has a little cartilage lining it, and it has collagen. Same thing for the joint between the incus and the stapes. It's just like a joint between the bones in your finger or the bones in your arm, and it has all those joint components, including collagen. And because collagen is affected in Stickler syndrome, the joints between these bones can be affected as well. And so sometimes you can have a conductive hearing loss because of dysfunction of these joints, even if there's no fluid behind the eardrum at all. So we've talked about conductive hearing loss. Let's talk a little bit more about sensory neural hearing loss. So in sensory neural hearing loss, we have problems with the cochlea or the nerve from the cochlea. So here is an anatomic drawing of the cochlea itself. And you can see if we open up that cochlea, that spiral shaped organ, take the layer of bone off the outside, you can see it's divided into chambers. And there is a layer between those chambers. And if we look at that this way, it is lined with tiny sensory cells. So this is a cochlea that has had that whole bony outer surface taken off. And you can see all of this, almost this little stripe running along the inside of the cochlea. We're gonna zoom in to this area, this red box. And now we can see what that stripe really is. That stripe is these tiny little stereocilia or hair fibers on the ends of hair cells. So this is the top of the cell. 
And each one of these is a cell, one here, one here, one here, and it travels in rows. And this is the body of the cell on the inside. This is called an inner hair cell. And then we have three rows of outer hair cells, and you can see them here, one, two, three. And at the top of each cell, we have this little tuft of stereocilia. And so when fluid vibrates inside the cochlea, these little hair cells, these little hairs on the end of the hair cells are moving with that vib vibrating fluid. And when that happens, the cell is triggered to release a signal to the nerve endings of the cochlear nerve, which run right through this bottom part of the cochlea here. So the nerve endings are here connecting to the bottom of the cell. And this is again, what they look like. This beautiful electron micrograph shows us the inner hair cells and the outer hair cells. And the inner hair cells are most responsible for our hearing response. And the outer hair cells are what help us fine tune the frequency response. So if we're listening to one voice in the middle of a bunch of voices, the, the hair cells, the outer hair cells help us cone in on specific frequencies. Now, when the outer hair cells are damaged, as in this case, you can see the inner hair cells are still there, but the outer hair cells are gone, you get usually a mild or moderate sensory neural hearing loss because those drivers of hearing, the inner hair cell, are still there. But in this case, there is complete destruction of the outer and inner hair cells, and this would be a profound, severe to profound hearing loss, which is one little cluster of hair cell stereocilia there. This patient would have been unable to hear completely. And what's important to understand as it relates to Stickler syndrome is that because Stickler syndrome is a disorder of collagen generation, there is collagen throughout the inner portion of the cochlea. And it's within uh, the basilar membrane, which is sort of the base of this organ where the hair cells live. These are the outer hair cells here and the inner hair cell. So there's collagen filling this area. And there's collagen here in the tectorial membrane and in the other uh, components of the organ of cordy, which is the portion of the inside of the cochlea uh, that contains all these hearing elements. And so disorders of this collagen result in either hair cell death or limited hair cell function, uh, which can be progressive over time, resulting in progressive sensory neural hearing loss. So this graph shows the average hearing loss for a large group of patients with Stickler syndrome. And, what you, and this is separated by age. So the, the curve here is in patients younger than 20 years of age. And so we see this, this is sort of low frequencies moving to high. So we see mostly normal dipping off into the mild hearing loss range in the high frequencies. And as we divide this into age groups, this is 20 to 40 would be the middle curve. Greater than 40 years old would be the, the lowest curve here. We see that over time that hearing loss gets a little bit worse. So that's for all, all patients, all types of Stickler syndrome on average. Now, if we look at type 3 Stickler syndrome, where we know that the rate of hearing loss is higher, you can see that over time this is, is poorer. So again, the youngest group here, the less than 20 years old, is already starting out in the mild hearing loss range, uh, dipping into the moderate hearing loss range at the higher frequencies. But the 20 to 40 year old age group is in mild to moderate. And the greater than 40 year old is really in moderate and dipping down into the moderately severe range. So that's the average hearing loss for type, type three Stickler syndrome. And here's type four Stickler syndrome. This is not stratified by age because the uh, prevalence of type four Stickler syndrome is relatively low and so it didn't have enough patients to stratify by age. But you can see that the average hearing level for people with type four Stickler syndrome is starting off in the moderate hearing loss range in the low frequencies and dipping down into the moderately severe and severe hearing loss range as we go. Uh, into the higher frequencies. So this is helpful to understand just how the type of Stickler syndrome can affect the type and degree of hearing loss that is present. So we talked about how hearing loss happens and why it happens, but what we should talk about next is what do we do about it? You know, how do you manage this hearing loss? So the first key principle is early intervention, early treatment of hearing loss. So before universal newborn hearing screening, and I should say, in the United States, all babies are screened for hearing loss before they leave the nursery if they're born in a hospital or if they're born at home within the first month of life. And before the newborn hearing screening, the average child with severe to profound hearing loss um, would be diagnosed usually around two to three years of age. 
And this would have a serious impact on educational uh, development. With the newborn hearing screening, the average child with hearing loss is diagnosed at two to three months of age. It's confirmed by two to three months of age. And so that difference, that extra few years um, and ability to intervene and treat has resulted in a significant improvement in the educational outcomes for children with hearing loss. So what that means is it's really important to follow up a newborn hearing screening that someone doesn't pass. And what do you do when, when a child doesn't pass a newborn hearing screening? The first thing you wanna do is you wanna confirm the hearing loss uh, by getting a formal hearing test uh, that beyond just the screening, but you wanna initiate appropriate consultations. So you wanna have a speech evaluation. You wanna contact early intervention services, which in the United States are free services that are provided for all children up to three years of age um, that include physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and other services, uh, which, which are really helpful for children with hearing loss. You wanna be fitted with hearing aids if appropriate and, and get all the sorts of um, educational uh, supports that are necessary. And also to identify local services such as infant and child uh, program, infant and toddler programs for children with hearing loss um, and family programs to help families understand uh, how to manage this. And this is all extremely important. It's also important to follow the hearing. So for a child with a diagnosed hearing loss, you wanna really keep following that every six months, at least if it's stable, but even if it's not stable, you wanna do it more often than, than six months, maybe every three months. Um, and I usually get hearing loss, hearing tests every six months until at least third grade. Um, and even then, if things are changing, I would continue with every six months. But if things have been perfectly stable up until third grade, I would get them still at least once a year. Um, and any changes in hearing concerns, either with the, the child or with the parent, that should warrant a, an immediate hearing test to assess for any change in the hearing. So I think that's really important that we don't just diagnose it, but we continue to follow the hearing loss especially in a condition like Stickler syndrome where it can be progressive. Now, what do we do for older children in the classroom to help optimize the hearing? First of all, uh, we use preferential seating in the classroom. Now this year, I've been having lots of conversations with families and schools about what do you do in the classroom when someone's wearing a mask? And what do you do in the classroom when someone, uh, uh, when, when, or if you're doing virtual learning at home and, and the class is being taught via a Zoom call? So we do have some uh, guidance for that uh, on the Mass Ioneer website under our COVID section uh, with resources for parents and teachers and students. Um, but some things that you would do in the classroom, whether or not the teacher is wearing masks, would be you let the children with, hear with hearing loss sit at the front of the class. Um, if one ear is better, you want that ear pointing towards the teacher. You also want the classroom to be evaluated by an expert in uh, in teaching children with hearing loss, either a teacher of the deaf or an educational audiologist, to make sure that the classroom is optimized uh, from a listening standpoint. So sometimes that means carpeting in the room. Uh, if there are uh, things in the room that make ambient noise, such as a heating or air conditioning unit, you want the child with hearing loss to be seated at a distance from that unit, not right next to it. Um, you want the classroom doors to be closed, things like that to reduce ambient noise in the classroom. Um, it's also really important to have the teacher wear an FM system. So this is a microphone that the teacher wears, and there's either a speaker in the room or an ear level FM system, or the uh, hearing aids will often have a, a, a direct ability to directly connect to the FM system. And this is really helpful for improving the signal to noise ratio, meaning the teacher's voice is amplified and background noise is not. That's very helpful in the classroom environment. And we also talk about having all these things documented either with an IEP, or a 504 plan, and it's very important that these things are, are written down and not just done uh, sort of ad hoc as the, as, the, as the teacher in school prefer, uh, because that way it can really be followed and changed if necessary if things aren't working out well. We also wanna protect your residual hearing. So kids that have, or adults too, that have hearing loss um, are already at a disadvantage, but they're still at risk for hearing loss related to noise. So, if you're gonna to go to rock concerts or if you're gonna to go to a NASCAR race or a monster truck show, you know, these are environments where you can have noise-induced hearing loss uh, really just with a limited exposure. So I recommend for younger children, earmuff style ear hearing protection because earplugs you know, are fairly effective for adults, but with a kid, it's hard to know if it's actually in place and working. And so I always recommend earmuff style hearing protection because it, you know it's, if it's on, it, it's working. 
I think these are great even for kids going to the movies where they're very loud or you know, if you're going to go to a parade or, or um, you know, some a, a loud party. Uh, some kids are just more comfortable uh, having some earmuffs on for these loud, loud environments because it's just more enjoyable. Um, same thing for music. Uh, kids are listening to music just as much as they always have been, but have a lot more control with personal listening devices. You can actually set a volume limit. So every device is a little bit different, but if you go into music in your settings and you choose volume limit, then you can set the maximum volume. And if you, you know, I usually say no more than about two thirds or 70% of the way across. Uh, if you're all the way to the right, that's too loud. That will be a toxic noise level. Um, if you're down in this range or lower, you can listen for hours uh, very safely. So that's, that's what I would usually say for a volume limit. And in addition to all these accommodations and strategies, we really often rely on hearing aids for kids with hearing loss to be able to develop normal speech and language. Now, the hearing aids of today are extremely advanced compared to the hearing aids of 15 or 20 years ago. Hearing aids are digital, which enables them to be smaller. For children, we always recommend behind the ear hearing aids. The in-ear hearing aids ha have to be remade if you grow, and we know children are growing, so it, when your ear grows, all you need to change in a behind the ear hearing aid is this ear mold, and that's very easy to do. Uh, but these are also more powerful than an in-the-ear uh, hearing aid and have better features. So, you know, the newer uh, digital hearing aids have rechargeable batteries, which is really nice. They have Bluetooth connectivity, which a lot of my patients find really exciting. They can hook up to um, an iPhone or they, the, the radio in the car uh, or all sorts of things that can be connected to and they can, they can listen in. Also, the Bluetooth usually connects up to the newer FM system, so you don't need a special boot or jack on the hearing aid. So new hearing aids have all these really nice features. They, you know, there's an app on your iPhone that you can control them with or even your Android phone, depending on the brand of hearing aid. And these are really nice features. Um, they're also just much cooler looking than they used to be. I mean, you can choose colors, you can choose the color of your ear mold, um, and, and people, you know, tend to think of a, a hearing aid as something, you know, that seems like medical or like a device that, 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 sh that, that doesn't, you know, that you're trying to hide. And for my patients with hearing aids, we really try to focus on making it part of your personality and something that's fun and cool that you get to take part of. And, and most of my patients who wear hearing aids actually feel, uh, you know, that, that it's like, it, it's, it's part of their flair. And so that's a good, I think, a good uh, thing. So, you know, we talked about sensory neural hearing loss and conductive hearing loss. And there's some, you know, some types of hearing loss, conductive hearing loss in particular, where a conventional hearing aid, a hearing aid that goes into the ear canal, might not be the best option. Um, a conventional hearing aid works by... Uh, increasing the volume of the sound through a tiny speaker, basically. So there's a microphone uh, on the part of the hearing aid that's behind the ear, and there's a little tube, uh, which at the, the back end of the hearing aid is connected to basically a mechanical speaker. So you're, you're just making the vibrations in the air more powerful. But if you have a significant conductive hearing loss, like uh, you know problem with the ossicles or bones of hearing, or thick, thick fluid behind the eardrum that you just can't get to go away even with tubes or, or other surgeries, sometimes putting a hearing aid into the ear canal is not the most efficient way to get sound into the inner ear. And in fact, we talked about this when we were discussing how the hearing test works. When we want to bypass the middle ear, we use bone conduction. We use that oscillator that goes behind the ear or on the forehead to send that signal directly to the inner ear. Well, there are some hearing devices which take advantage of that technology, of bone conduction technology, to get sound directly to the inner ear. And an example of this would be uh, things that you may have heard of called the Baja or the Ponto. And these work by uh, sending vibrations through the skull directly to the inner ear. They're best for conductive hearing loss, though they are used in some cases for sensory neural hearing loss, for example, in the case of single-sided deafness, we will sometimes use a bone conduction hearing device. Um, but what we can see here is this is a child that's wearing on a headband a, a bone conduction hearing aid, or Baja. Uh, Baja is a brand name, um, which, but it initially stood for bone anchored hearing aid. Um, but the, the 
the two main companies that make a headband mounted uh, uh, bone anchor hearing device would be the Baja uh, and the Ponto, um, which are made by two different companies. This is another bone conduction hearing device. This one doesn't use a headband. This uses an adhesive sticker, which sticks to the skin behind the ear. And this is called an adhere. And that's another bone conduction hearing device that doesn't require surgery. So these are all external uh, hearing devices. They're also implanted bone conduction hearing devices. So this device is what we call a Baja Connect. So this is surgically implanted. This part is a little titanium implant that literally gets screwed into a hole that's drilled in the bone uh, behind the ear, just behind and, and, and the top of the level of the ear. And then this fixture, uh, this abutment, has a screw inside it that screws into the fixture. So this goes into the bone, this heals into place, and this abutment comes through the skin. And then this outer part, this is the, the processor, snaps into the abutment and it sends the vibrations directly into the skull. And this gives you a very, very clear sound. The problem with this is that this, this device requires a, an opening in the skin. So this metal abutment actually comes out through an opening in the skin. And particularly for children, this can be difficult to manage because there's a propensity to having uh, wound infections or skin overgrowth. The skin can try to grow over the top of the abutment and there can be inflammation or granulation tissue that forms around it. Um, this tends to be less of a problem for adults, um, but for kids, it, it can be a big problem. And I've had a number of cases where this you know, works great, you can hear well with it, but you ha I've had to remove some of these or treat them with antibiotics repeatedly because of recurrent infections. And so there are some things you can do. You can put on a longer abutment or you can use medicines that you apply around it to keep that, that from healing over. But this can, can be a big problem. And so there's another version of this same device where there's a magnet that instead of this abutment, there's just a magnet that goes under the skin and that gets attached to the fixture and then the skin gets closed up at the top and the external device just attracts to it magnetically. Um, and that has the advantage of having totally intact skin, but the disadvantage is there's some loss of the sound vibration across that gap, that gap between the magnet and the external device uh, through, through the skin. And so there are some newer devices uh, which are actually fully implanted. At least the part that makes the vibrations is fully implanted. So this is a new device called the Osseo. And this whole portion is implanted underneath the skin. And what we have here is this box is a piezoelectric uh, transducer. So this is worn on the outside and it has a battery and a microphone. And through electromagnetic induction, it sends the electric signal into this part of the processor, which has a magnet right here. And those, those signals, that signal goes to the, uh, the portion, the actuator portion of the device, and the vibrations are created right here. So here's that fixture, this thing is right here, and those vibrations go right through the fixture into the skull. And so this has all the advantages of the connect device in terms of the the, the power of those vibrations going directly into the skull bone, but it doesn't have an open uh, wound in the skin. It's completely closed skin. Uh, so it has the advantages of both those things. And this is very new. This just came out in the past year and a half. And there's another device called the Bone Bridge, which is very similar to this. Uh, and so this field of bone conduction hearing devices is sort of rapidly changing with all these new devices that have come out just in the, or been FDA approved in the last couple of years. But these can be really nice for patients with a significant conductive hearing loss uh, to be able to get better, um, better sound into the ear. So what about patients where the hearing loss has gotten so bad that neither a bone conduction hearing device nor a traditional hearing aid is effective? This is when we get to sort of the severe to profound range of hearing loss. Uh, well, now we have something called the cochlear implant. Cochlear implants have been around they were invented in the 1950s, but were really first FDA approved in the 1980s and FDA approved for children in the 1990s, uh, first in 1990 and then with the age getting lower um, uh, gradually after that so that now they're FDA approved for 12 months and older um, for children that are born deaf. But basically this has two components as well. There's an internal component 
which is the receiver stimulator here. And just like that OSI, it has a magnet here and a coil which receives the, uh, the information from the external portion. And there is an electrode array which has little contact electrodes on its surface. So this is the array inserted into the cochlea and it sort of curves around the spiral of the cochlea. And there are these little electrodes here and depending on the device, there's anywhere from 12 to 22 electrodes that stimulate that cochlear nerve directly. So in an ear, like the one we saw earlier that has no hair cells anymore, the electrodes do the job of the hair cells. They do the direct stimulation of that cochlear nerve and send that signal to the brain. And this is the external component. This is that processor. Uh, on the outside, this is the, the magnet or the coil. The processor is here and has the micro, there's microphones either on, this, on, the processor, on the coil or on the processor itself. And that sends the sounds into the inside. And this can be really amazing for people that have severe to profound hearing loss. In general, these are FDA approved for bilateral severe to profound hearing loss, but over recent years, the indications are expanding. Uh, and we have seen that there are significant benefits for people that have asymmetric hearing loss uh, in the severe to profound range, or even single-sided deafness, where one ear is normal and the other ear has profound hearing loss. And we are seeing, uh, as we do more and more cases of this type, uh, significant benefits for people that have, uh, for, that have that specific pattern of hearing loss. So, you know, in managing hearing loss, I do think it's really important to have a multidisciplinary strategy uh, because there are so many different factors uh, that need to be managed. And um, our team at Mass Eye and Ear includes the pediatric otolaryngologist, serotologist, so myself, uh, my partners, Dr. Kimi, Dr. Lee, Dr. Macarius. Uh, we are so privileged to work with a skilled geneticist, Dr. Paula Goldenberg, uh, who's available to counsel our patients that have genetic hearing loss. Uh, we have a, a, a large team of uh, really talented audiologists, too numerous <laughs> to mention all their names uh, in this lecture. A speech and language pathologist, Cheryl Bakey, who is really focused on caring for children with hearing loss and managing their speech and language development. A teacher of the deaf, Carrie Brolier, who works with our families in terms of getting the appropriate access to school uh, and to uh, the right academic accommodations. And also our social worker, our neuropsychologist, case manager, nurses, all these members of the team really come together to help each child get all the attention that they really deserve and need to optimally treat their hearing loss. And, you know, this is a little carnival that we throw every year to just bring families together and give them the opportunities to just play and have fun and get to know other people with hearing loss. And, and sometimes they talk about their devices and things like that, but most of all, they just play and have a lot of fun. And so, you know, on that, I will say thank you so much for your attention. And I believe we're going to pause uh, now for some uh, questions and answers. But if anyone has questions for me that they would like to uh, raise offline, you can feel free to email me at this email address, uh, and I'd be happy uh, to answer those questions. So thanks uh, so much for your attention, and I hope you enjoy the talk. Please unmute and put on your camera again. Thank you so much for that. That was a very comprehensive presentation and I actually learned quite a bit from that. Um, so we've had several questions that have been coming in and so let us go to those next. Looks like my internet is slow today. Come on. Oh, PowerPoint is not responding. Okay, so let me just start asking the first question while I'm working on this technical issue. So, um, 
The first question says, I have lost half of my hearing in one ear. They can't find a cause, so chalk it up to a virus. Any evidence of hearing loss related to Marfan syndrome? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, you know, there is not a ton in the scientific literature about hearing loss in Marfan syndrome and the mechanisms of hearing loss in Marfan syndrome, but, but it is something that is observed. Um, and there are a couple of studies that have um, looked at Marfan syndrome and hearing loss and, and found that as many as 50% of, of children and adolescents uh, with Marfan syndrome had hearing loss of some kind. Most of that is conductive hearing loss, but probably about 15 to 20 percent is sensory neural hearing loss as well. Um, so there, there is some evidence that Marfan syndrome can be associated with hearing loss, and it may be the case, just as we discussed uh, with Stickler syndrome with you know, some of the collagen deficits that we see, uh, that, that, that some of those same features can impact hearing it in Marfan syndrome. I have seen one study that looked at the ossicles, the bones of hearing in people with Marfan syndrome, and found that those bones were, um, in many cases, uh, abnormally developed, uh, either longer uh, or shaped differently. So uh, there are a number of features of Marfan syndrome that could potentially contribute to hearing loss. That being said, uh, someone who suddenly loses half of their hearing in one ear may have that happen because of any number of reasons. Uh, which are unrelated to Marfan syndrome, and that could be a virus. Uh, that is something that does happen sometimes. Um, and, and, you know, there, there are other times where it happens spontaneously for no good reason. So if you've lost hearing, it's really important. The most important thing is that you're uh, evaluated by an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and we look for all the other potential causes of hearing loss. Um, and especially with hearing loss in one ear, it is important uh, to get an MRI to assess the inner ear to look for any other problems that could be causing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I know that you did go over this in your presentation about chronic ear infections for children where they do have uh, the tubes put in their ears. Uh, can you just, uh, is that the best treatment for chronic ear infections? And how about for adults? Yeah, so great question. So often ear tube insertion is the best treatment for chronic ear infections when there's chronic fluid that just won't go away with medical treatments. Um, but sometimes the underlying problem for chronic ear infections could be allergy uh, and making sure that you're treating underlying allergies well can help reduce that. Sometimes even acid reflux can contribute to ear infections and making sure that's under control is important. There's also a new technology called eustachian tube balloon dilation, which is basically a way that we can treat the problem of the eustachian tube not working. You saw in the video that ear tubes work by making an incision in the eardrum, but they're not really fixing the underlying problem. They're not fixing the fact that the eustachian tube isn't opening well enough. And this new technology allows us to stretch out that eustachian tube and widen it. And for a certain group of patients, patients where we know that, that the the ear infection, chronic ear infections are due to uh, narrowness or swelling of that eustachian tube, that balloon dilation treatment can actually be very effective. Mm -hmm. and how long does that last, that balloon dilation? Well, we don't know. FDA approval for that came out about two and a half years ago. Uh, so we have long-term data of about five years uh, per mm -hmm. patients and, and the initial studies that were done for the FDA approval for this uh, treatment um, show about 50% effectiveness over, uh, over the, the longer term follow-up period. So, um, you know, about half of people had complete resolution of their, of their symptoms even over that longer follow-up period. Okay, great, thank you. So this question is asked by Lori, is a cochlear implant surgery safe for someone who has Marfan? So good question. You know, there's nothing to my knowledge about a cochlear implant that would be more dangerous or less safe for someone with Marfan syndrome than for someone who doesn't have Marfan syndrome. I would just say that, you know, cochlear implant surgery takes, you know, anywhere from an hour and a half to three hours under general anesthesia. And so it's important that if you're going to have cochlear implant surgery, that it's done in a facility where the anesthesiology team is experienced in caring for people with Marfan syndrome 
And if there are any other underlying cardiac abnormalities or other medical concerns, that that's, that's an important part of the workup prior to cochlear implant surgery. The other issue is that with a cochlear implant, uh, there are some limits to the ability to get an MRI. Mm -hmm. uh, in the older implants, you couldn't get an MRI without having a minor procedure to remove the magnet from the device. The newer cochlear implants over the past few years have an MRI safe magnet, but if any, um, if any medical issues associated with Marfan syndrome are being followed with MRI scans, that's an important thing to discuss with your surgeon prior to cochlear implantation so you can be prepared for that and make a decision about what type of implant to use uh, that, that would, wouldn't affect uh, or, or to limit the, the impact on your ability to have appropriate MRI uh, tests. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. So this question asks, what does a long-term plan for hearing follow-ups look like in Stickler syndrome? Yeah, so you know, I think it's important if there is any hearing loss that that at least once a year, if we're talking about you know for adults, just an annual hearing test. And I think with that, um, you'll be able to catch most gradual changes in hearing that might occur. I would also say that if there is any perceived change in hearing, even if it's not at the time that you're due for a hearing test, you can always come in and get a hearing test sooner because if you notice something has changed, you know probably something has, and it's a good idea to have that evaluated uh, promptly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and do you recommend surgery for ear trumpet as a treatment consistent with Stickler syndrome? So I am not sure what an ear trumpet is. Okay. Um, but if Marit is on this call and wants to put something in the chat box to clarify, that would be fine. I mean, I think of an ear trumpet as the, uh, as the 1800s hearing aid, where, which is a, a metal horn that you put in the ear uh, to be able to listen a little bit better. And before hearing aids existed, that, that was you know, probably the best option. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not quite sure what we're asking about in this case with ear trumpet. Okay. And maybe we can get back to her on that and when she clarifies. Um, does cranial facial abnormality abnormalities like cleft palate and PRS interfere with chronic ear infections and hearing loss. So I think you covered some of this in your talk. I'm not sure what PRS refers to either. So um, maybe you know that. Yeah, so PRS would be Pierre Robin sequence or Pierre Robin syndrome where there's a short jaw and often a cleft palate. Um, and absolutely in, in both of those conditions we do see a much higher incidence of chronic ear infections and middle ear fluid, which is associated with hearing loss. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that works is because those abnormalities affect the shape of the eustachian tube, which is that tube that allows the middle ear to drain its fluid into the back of the nose. And because of the abnormalities in those syndromes, the eustachian tube doesn't work very well. So we do see chronic fluid building up, chronic ear infections and hearing loss associated with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, this is a good question. What about dual sensory impairment or deaf blindness? Because Stickler syndrome patients often have both hearing and vision loss. Yeah, this is a great question. And I think really important um, for Stickler syndrome or any syndrome where we have a risk to both vision and hearing. And I think the key here is to really make sure that you are working with um, an ophthalmologist and an ear, nose, and throat doctor and an audiologist that are comfortable managing both of these problems. That, you know, I don't know that having vision impairment affects the way that we would treat hearing loss in terms of what um, device we would use or what accommodations we would use, but it might impact what environment a child would be in for schooling. And it also might impact what device you would choose from the standpoint of if you got a hearing aid, you might want a hearing aid that has controls that you can feel, that you don't have to see uh, the writing or, or be able to see things that, you know, that, are, that are difficult um, to see. But also, when you look at the cochlear implants that are available, if someone were electing to have a cochlear implant, you should look at all the different available devices because the interfaces for these different devices are sometimes more favorable for someone with vision impairment or less favorable uh, depending on the device. So it's a good idea to 
be able to sort of sample and try these things out in advance uh, if we're concerned about both visual, uh, low vision and, and hearing loss. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, so this person has severe hearing loss in her right ear and when she has an ear infection in her body, it does not work at all. And that's been frequent during the last three years. Um, her specialists do not know a lot about Stickler syndrome. So just curious about any advice. Yeah, you know, that's, that's tricky. I, it's hard to say uh, with relatively limited information and not being able to examine the ear exactly what's going on in there. Um, but there are, it's not uncommon if you have an underlying hearing loss for that hearing loss to be worse if you were to get an ear infection on top of it because we're sort of uh, adding a conductive hearing loss from fluid on top of the underlying hearing loss that's already there. Um, and my advice would be, you know, to find uh, a specialist, uh, perhaps that's that's very experienced in managing hearing loss in people with Stickler syndrome or just in general. Um, and you know, I did put my email address at the end of the slide. If you wanted to send me an email address, I could try to help you identify someone uh, in your area that might have additional expertise on this problem. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Cohen. It is one o'clock. I just want to. Uh, we have a few more questions. Would you mind just staying on for a few more minutes? Sure, I can stay on to answer a couple more questions. Okay, great. Um, again, uh, how about if your ear tubes keep falling out mm. as a child or as an adult? Yeah, that's a tough problem. Tubes are designed to last about a year, and if you have ongoing eustachian tube problems that can be very uh, difficult to keep needing to go back. There are tubes that do last longer. And sometimes when we have a case where the tubes just won't stay in the drum, I'll do a surgery where I actually reconstruct the eardrum and put a tube in a little uh, bony groove alongside the eardrum and that can last for several years. So, you know, there are things that can be done, but it's a challenging problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so this uh, question is by someone who has LDS type one. And recently in the last few years, lost hearing in one ear and partial in the other. With a hearing aid, they're almost at 75% hearing. What are the chances this is where the hearing loss ends? It's a good question. And it's, you know, it's really hard to predict the answer to that for any one specific patient. Um, you know, we certainly can see progressive hearing loss uh, in LDS. And it, sometimes it, it progresses and then stops, and then that's just where it is. But um, sometimes it does gradually get worse over time, and it's hard to say. But my advice would be to continue to get regular hearing tests and, and make sure uh, that if you do perceive a change or if it seems like the hearing aids aren't working, uh, that you go in and get it tested again so that you can have the best, uh, best option for treatment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see that several people are raising their hands. If you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A. We can't respond to the raising hands on, on, on this software. So um, uh, this question is, does, do all like uh, uh, air physicians do bone con con conduction tests? She doesn't remember ever seeing that test. Yeah, so this is a standard part of, of any complete hearing test. And it's typically done with an oscillator that is on a little, usually a metallic headband or some other headband, and it sits behind the ear or on the forehead. And, it, and you don't necessarily feel the vibrations, but you can hear the sound through that device as they test it. So yes, that is a standard part of mm -hmm. a complete hearing test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the last question she has here is about how do we find somebody knowledgeable? Uh, Marit, we can certainly help you. Uh, we have a help and resource center that can uh, look at your location and try to find somebody uh, near you to uh, provide you with some uh, quality care for Stickler syndrome. So, um, you know, connect through our help center on uh, at marfan.org slash E3ESC and we can do that. So I want to thank you so much for this. This was a really uh, great session. Um, I learned a lot. And so I, I want to thank you very much. I'm going to close this out and just uh, share a few more slides. 
So again, um, questions, more questions, marfan.org backslash E3 ask. Please complete the session survey as we showed you before. Um, in addition, now we're also having an overall uh, E3 summit survey. So whether you attended one session or you attended all 70, your input is invaluable to us to help us build future programs and services that will meet your needs. So to show your appreciation, uh, to show our appreciation for your responses, we are uh, going to provide three uh, summit survey submissions will be se selected to win a $50 uh, prepaid international debit card. So please submit your surveys now. Um, and only the survey submitted by 11 p.m. on Eastern on Wednesday, September 16th, will be eligible for the drawing. So the survey can be accessed at marfan.org slash E3 survey. And Bruno, if you can put that into the chat box so they have that link, that would be great. Uh, we do have exhibitors in our exhibit hall, so please visit them. Um, all of the recordings will be there for quite some time. We're probably going to have them up until the uh, end of the year. So uh, we know we had uh, at least 70 sessions. We can take your time looking through all of them. Connect with the community on the app. If you use social media, uh, use the hashtag E3Summit20 uh, to connect to us. And uh, we always appreciate any donations to help us make more programming possible at marfan.org. Um, and just a last note uh, for those that have aortic uh, disease, um, Aortic Disease Awareness Week is coming up on September 19th through the 26th. Um, and if you would like to uh, participate in this worldwide event that is powered by the Marfan Foundation, um, we hope that you can raise your hands to the awareness of the risk factors for aortic disease. Information is available on the Summit app, on our website, and in social media. So in just ending, um, Dr. Cohen, would you just like to say a, a few last words? Yes, well, thanks so much for the opportunity to present here. It was really uh, an enjoyable opportunity for me, and, uh, and, and hopefully I can uh, see some of the same people again next year. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your help with this. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.